My name is James Bean. Welcome to Spiritual Awakening Radio. The main topic today is exploring Sant Mat teachings found in the Hindu scriptures. But I have some other short essay topics to explore as well in a very ambitious program. Here's the table of contents for today's program. We'll try and get to as many of these as we can squeeze into this hour. Quotes from the Upanishads, Bhagavad Gita, Gospel of Thomas, Parallels, Fending for One's Self as a Spiritual Seeker versus Following and Getting to Know a Living Spiritual Path. In a book I once read, it says books are not the answer. You can't read your way to enlightenment. Another short essay in Sant Mat, the centers of power, the location or real estate never remains the same. What about those who get reinitiated, have been initiated by more than one guru? Sants of antiquity, long before the time of Kabir. The definition of Sant Mat. The eight limbs of yoga or stages of spiritual development, including the five precepts. Initiation into Srit Shabd Yoga. A paraphrase of the teachings of Maharishi Mehi. The seven key practices of Sant Mat, the five jewels of Sant Mat. A lot about form versus formlessness. Sarguna, or God with form, versus Narguna, the way of the formless God in the Bhagavad Gita of Krishna. A transition from the world of form to formlessness. How a formless God communicates with souls living in worlds of form. The radiant form is the key to exploring inner space. The inner master. The formless one assumes forms in order to communicate with souls in all realms and escorts souls back to the original abode. The outer master guides souls to the inner master. The inner master guides souls back to the formless God. From light to sound, from form to formlessness, stages of meditation. Krishna, the Gita, and the power between the eyebrows, the third eye center. That's the table of contents. Let's see how far we go, how far we can get into covering those topics. A couple of passages from the Upanishads. The Upanishads are to Hinduism what the New Testament is to Christianity. You might think of the Vedas as like the Old Testament stage and the Upanishads as like the New Testament or the Gnostic Gospels, a more mystical section. It says in the Mundaka Upanishad, May we hear only what is good for all. May we see only what is good for all. May we serve you, Lord of love, all our life. May we be used to spread your peace on earth. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace, peace, peace in the sound or word. This is from the Katha Upanishad. May the Lord of Love protect us. May the Lord of Love nourish us. May the Lord of Love strengthen us. May we realize the Lord of Love. May we live with love for all. May we live in peace with all. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace, peace in the sound. From the Chandogya Upanishad. Those who depart from this world without knowing who they are or what they truly desire have no freedom here or hereafter. But those who leave here knowing who they are and what they truly desire have freedom everywhere, both in this world and in the next. Also from the Chand Dogya Upanishad, the famous Upanishadic prayer. 
Lead me from the unreal to the real. Lead me from darkness to light. Lead me from death to immortality. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace, peace, peace. In the sound. This is from the Nada Bindu Upanishad. Our mind is like the mad elephant that is wandering in the garden of sense objects and is only disciplined by the practice of the yoga of sound. The following is from the Bhagavad Gita along with some parallel passages I found quotes from the Gospel of Thomas some Krishna Christ parallels in the Bhagavad Gita it says the great life here now Arjuna how thou shalt have the full vision of me if thy heart is set on me and if Striving for yoga, I am thy refuge supreme. And I will speak to thee of that wisdom and vision, which when known there is nothing else for thee to know. Among thousands of men perhaps one strives for perfection, and among thousands of those who strive perhaps one knows me in truth. The visible forms of my nature are eight, earth, water, fire, air, ether, the mind, reason, and the sense of I, or i -ness. But beyond my visible nature is my invisible spirit. This is the fountain of life whereby this universe has its being. All things have their life in this life, and I am their beginning and end. Some parallels from the Gospel of Thomas and the Mandaean Gnostic scriptures, which are Aramaic texts, some of my favorite Gnostic scriptures of the Western world. Gospel of Thomas, saying 23, Yeshua said, I shall choose you one from a thousand and two from ten thousand, and they will stand as a single one. In the Mandaean scriptures, I lifted mine eyes to heaven, and my soul waited on the house of life. And the life, or God, who heard my cry, sent toward me a deliverer. Life supported life. Life found its own. Its own self did life find. And my soul found that for which it had looked or searched. Renowned is life and victorious in the name of the great life, sublime light. Be praised. Back to the Gita of Krishna. Rest in me. In this whole vast universe, in this whole vast universe, there is nothing higher than I. All the worlds have their rest in me as many pearls upon a string. Gospel of Thomas, saying 90. Come to me, for my yoke is comfortable, and my lordship is gentle, and you will find rest for yourselves. We'll get back to some Hindu scriptures in a bit, but first some other essays I wanted to share today. This is titled, Fending for One's Self versus Following as a Spiritual Seeker, Following and Getting to Know a Living Spiritual Path, a debate that many have. You know, God is within me, so what do I need an institution for? Well, we may, we may not need an institution, but... The question that many face is, do they need a teacher, or have they gone as far as they can go on their own? And in order to take the next step, well, there has to be a next step. And so there is this debate 
Is it all within me and I don't need another t any other source or a teacher or do I need a teacher in order to progress spiritually? It takes a while to get a sense of what spiritual master teacher one is attracted to or resonates with. Someone you can trust. It's not easy to come to that place. I have high standards, so for me it's a very short list. I'm quite familiar with the histories of most everyone in the world of Santmat and Radhaswami. The good, the bad, and the unspeakable. But having gone through various stages of seeking and finding myself, I can easily say I would never go back to being an outsider seeker, looking in, wondering what the meditation practice is. It's true that the reality is within. The saints have always taught that the light and sound of God are within everyone. The genuine spiritual masters serve as catalysts for spiritual experience and focus their students within, not spending all of their time on outward institutions, rites, rituals, or organizations. Being on one's own without having the benefit of tapping into the collective wisdom of the masters, the gnosis of the ages, as embodied by a living school of spirituality, without knowing about the explorations of inner space done over the centuries by the saints and mystics, who have mapped out the inner regions of consciousness, would indeed be a great handicap. Life is short. We can remake all the same mistakes and reinvent the wheel. Or we can move at a faster pace with the benefit of the collective insights and spiritual influences transmitted from one generation to the next over time. Essenes, Gnostics, Sufis, and Sants. Scary thought if there was no Sant Mott being left to fend for myself, rummaging through a disappointing, impoverished world of pseudo-Gnostics, some vampire Gnostic with his baptismal tank in his dark, musty basement, putting up with 19th century Euro-occultists with their meat and wine and speculation about lost traditions that they're not really part of themselves, pretend Essenes reading their channeled scriptures, always and ever searching for that elusive mystic church of Meister Eckhart at the corner of Maine and Union, and never finding it. Those are scary thoughts for me. Makes me appreciate the path of the Masters all the more. So for me, the answer is, I took things as far as I could on my own to try and figure out the secrets of a spiritual path, but I would not go back to that place again. I would much rather stay in the world of a spiritual community and access to that wisdom. I would never go back to just being that seeker on my own, trying to figure things out without anyone else, without a community, without any shared knowledge from those who have lived in the past for all of those centuries. A living school of, of mysticism, a living school of spirituality is absolutely priceless. But it does, of course, come down to who do you trust? Who are you comfortable with? And it does take a little bit of time to find that answer out for yourself. In a book I once read, it says books are not the answer. Stefan Holler, the Gnostic bishop of Ecclesia Gnostica, once said, in a book, you can't read your way to enlightenment. The following is from Saint G, a book called Streams in the Desert. Rishis, Munis, Mahatmas, the saints and masters, the beloveds of God, and those who came on the path after coming in this world, they wrote down whatever obstacles they had to face and how they removed those obstacles, how they left the pinned or physical plane and went to Brahmanand, one of the inner regions, 
how they rose above body consciousness and whatever came in their meditation, in their practice, in their experience. All this they wrote down in the form of scriptures or Vedas and Shastras for our benefit, for our guidance. But by only reading these holy books of the religious scriptures, we cannot have that experience of the saints, which they had. We will have that experience only when we do the work of the holy book or the work of those religious scriptures by putting them into practice. Otherwise, only by reading we cannot enjoy the experiences of those great souls. A quote from Streams in the Desert by Sant Ji, also known as Jabe Singh of the Sant Bani Ashram. A wonderful book which is now online called Streams in the Desert. Or as Rumi once said, you know, get, get your own myth, you know, have your own uh, experience. It's not enough just to be content with uh, learning about the exploits of others who lived in earlier times. We have to have our own spiritual practice in the here and now. And then we are doing what those earlier saints and mystics were doing. Ironically, Stefan Haller's quote came from a book, as did the passage from Sant G. Scripture reading, and especially studying the teachings of the Masters, is very helpful and can make it easier for us to escape our own lesser mental chatter and be inspired to follow the path more accurately. My spiritual master, Swami Sant Sevi G, even described reading the writings of saints, mystics, or scriptures as a, quote, level of satsang, unquote. And this is especially helpful for us in the West to tap into the wisdom of traditional Sant Mat as, practice, as practiced since ancient times in rural India. I'm blessed with many rare books. And one of my missions in life is to make that wisdom more readily available to others in need of it. So many have a difficult time getting complete guidance or come from a new age or a religious background that can filter and distort and be a kind of disadvantage to truly appreciating the depths and heights of a subtle mystical path like Sant Mat. In fact, it may take a lifetime to truly appreciate the way of the saints. After about 20 years, I thought to myself, I'm starting to get this. You know, it's not an overnight thing to truly appreciate the teachings of the masters. As I mentioned earlier, this collective wisdom of the ages preserved by a living school of spirituality that's been at this for centuries. So a book is not enough. It may be true that a room without books is like a body without a soul, but as all true teachers say, there comes a time when we put down the book, close our eyes, and begin to meditate, going from theory to practice. Both theory and practice are good, but as the saints say, ultimately, Simran is my scripture, God's name is my holy book, and we leave the world behind as we explore inner space for ourselves during meditation practice. Next essay as we travel as fast as we can through our table of contents today. In Sant Mat, the centers of power, the location or real estate never remains the same forever. We're not all hanging out at some stoa of Pythagoras somewhere in the Mediterranean. There is no ancient golden temple of mysticism that's been around for thousands of years on planet Earth. It doesn't really work that way. A word about real estate. In the history of Sant Mat, there have been many ashram centers. Kabir resided in one place, Guru Nanak in another. Tulsi Sahib was in Hathras, as was his spiritual successor, Sant Sirswami. There remains the Sant Tulsi Sahib Mandir in, Ath in uh, Hathras to this very day. Swamiji and his successor, Huzur Maharaj, were in Agra. 
Baba Jamal Singh when was uh, sent to the Punjab, went to the Punjab. There's always movement and change. The real estate never remains the same forever. Whereas my friend says, there is no Vatican of the spirit. In other words, there is no permanent physical location on the earth plane that remains a center for the masters for all time. No ancient stoa of Pythagoras that's still operating. No golden temple of the mystics that lasts for very long. A saint will often start a new spiritual mission in a fresh location as part of the renewal process. New branches of the mystic tree grow to replace old ones as they fall away. Every new beginning comes from some other new beginnings. And a quote from Seneca, as often has been the case here in this realm of samsara, the world of changes, Nothing remains the same forever. There is no permanent Vatican of the Spirit, but movement, change, crisis, renewal, old branches that die off, new branches that take their place, and so as it al has it always been, you know, since the beginning. You're hearing Spiritual Awakening Radio. In a hurry to run through uh, my table of contents here of topics after the break, what about those who get reinitiated? Or give some thought to that. Is it possible to be initiated by more than one spiritual master? That and uh, we'll get into the Hindu scriptures more later on in the program today. Welcome back to Spiritual Awakening Radio in Hurry Today to get through this list of uh, topics and essays. An ambitious table of contents here to get through. What about those who get reinitiated, have been initiated by more than one guru? At a group I belong to online at Facebook, someone was asking who their spiritual master is if they have been initiated more than once, which can happen on this path of the masters. People might start off with one teacher and get more attracted to another. For some reason, many different things can happen. Not everyone's experience is the same. Who is your true master, your Sant Sat Guru? The one you say it is. The one that you say it is. The one that you have the most love for bhakti and respect for. The one you are the closest to above all others in this world and in the worlds beyond. The one that you're working with. The one who is working with you, mentoring you. The one that came to you in your hour of darkness, offering light, a light giver. The one who takes the darkness away. He's your beloved, your Guru Dev, the one who will come to you in all radiance. Some have been initiated more than once. Being reinitiated is not necessarily disrespect for your previous spiritual path or previous master or guru. Being reinitiated happens sometimes in Sant Mat. Swamiji Maharaj had some rules and regs about that, in fact. He said to consider one's previous master as being in or part of your current teacher and spiritual path. And if one has a Christian background or some religious background, and you have much respect for Jesus, bring Jesus with you. Or in other words, continue to have respect for the teachings of Christ, uh, as Sant Mat does, and other past masters. All true masters have been co-workers for the one God. The path is one. So, whatever your background is, it's not a sign of disrespect if you adopt a, a living spiritual path that's been around for a number of centuries and lives on and has inherited that wisdom, that knowledge, that spiritual charge and is with us in the world today. And if you get initiated by more than one teacher over the, the course of uh, 
years and decades, that's a fairly normal thing. Sometimes that happens. You're drawn to a, a certain teacher. So who your spiritual master is, the one that you say it is, the one that you're drawn to, the, the, that you have the most respect for out of anyone. Sants of antiquity, long before the time of Kabir. It's unknown who the first Sant or first Sant Sat Guru was in ancient times. There are references in Krishna Vaishnava texts to Sants. A few of the Rishi sages who authored certain Upanishads pertaining to the formless God, inner light and sound meditation, or Nada Shabda Yoga, some dating back to a few centuries BC, also seem to be at the same level as Sants. In somewhat more recent times, in some circles associated with Tulsi Sahib, Garak Nat, an 11th century Nath yogi, is considered to be a Sant, Baba Garak Nat, as he's called did indeed teach Surat Shabd Yoga. The Kabir Panth tradition of northern Sants includes much Nath Yogi terminology in their vocabulary and indeed was apparently somewhat influenced by the Nath tradition, perhaps more correctly pronounced Nath tradition, although it's spelled N-A-T-H. An example of Sants mentioned in a Hindu scripture called the Bhagavad Purana. Such individuals who have achieved the unity of Atman, or soul, and Param Atman, supreme soul, or God, are known as Sants. According to the Bhagavad Purana, there was no one greater than a Sant in the eyes of the Divine. Lord Krishna says to his disciple, quote, All devotees like you are very dear to me. They are dearer to me than Lord Brahma, Lord Sankara, Goddess Lakshmi, and even my own soul. Therefore I walk behind these saints, hoping that the dust arising from their holy feet would touch my body and purify me." Unquote. A quote from the Bhagavad Purana found in a larger quote by Swami Vyasanand, a paragraph from his book, The Inward Journey of the Soul, where he's talking about this uh, passage in the Bhagavad Purana, mentioning saints in ancient times. Living teachers reveal the methods of meditation. Swami Sant Seviji Maharaj, in his book The Harmony of All Religions, says, Saints and sages have unveiled all the mysteries of the spiritual journey and of self-realization in their discourses. All these techniques have been documented in different books, but without an accomplished teacher, we will not be able to grasp the correct technique of true knowledge. I certainly find that to be true in my experience. Uh, even if you have all the scriptures of the world in front of you, you still might miss it. You know, scriptures are not enough. Old cuneiform tablets are not enough. It's possible to be looking right at a spiritual discourse found in some ancient text or written by some medieval mystic and not really get what's going on in that text. I've seen people misinterpret scriptures as talking about extraterrestrials and flying saucers and whatnot. It's possible to completely be clueless about someone else's tradition speaking a different language existing thousands of years ago or centuries Ago. So without a living teacher, it's a severe disadvantage from the outside looking in, trying to figure out what's going on in some, some ancient text. In Hinduism and other Eastern religions, the main operating system, if you will, is the eight limbs of yoga, the stages of spiritual development. After the break, I want to explore, as we get back into Hinduism, uh, the eight limbs of yoga as outlined in the Pantanjali Yoga Sutras, because they really map out the spiritual journey. And you'll find that there are versions of these stages taught in Sikhism, the Sant tradition, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. So it's sort of like the Lennox operating system with many different distros of that main operating system going in different directions. But the 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 essence of it is this 
eight limbs of yoga system. That's the universal kind of stages of spiritual development as outlined in the Yoga Sutras. Coming up after these messages. Stay tuned. today, including the Hindu scriptures on Spiritual Awakening Radio. In Hinduism and other Eastern religions, the main operating system is the eight limbs of yoga, the stages of spiritual development, as articulated in the Pantanjali Yoga Sutras. One, Yama, also known as the five precepts, restraints or right attitude toward our environment. They are five and include ahimsa, or non-violence, satya, or truthfulness, three, non-stealing, four, sexual responsibility, and five, non-possessiveness, or do not covet. Those are the ethical precepts, the foundation, step one on the spiritual journey. Two, niyama, observances, or right attitude toward ourselves, of which there are five, including purity, contentment, self-discipline, the study of self and the scriptures, and surrender to God. Three, asana, or posture, the physical practice of yoga poses, which should be done balancing ease and effort. Four, pranayama, control of the vital life force or breathing exercises for some. Or in Santmat, the Santmat version of pranayama uh, is the natural slowing down of the breath as one enters into the deeply relaxed state of meditation. The Sant Tulsi Sahib Satsang greatly values the eight limbs of yoga as a kind of general outline of the stages and steps of spiritual development, but sort of modifies the Hindu pranayama, doing away with the breath technique, characterizing it as being simply a natural slowing down of the breath as a result of meditation practice, not involving any special or complicated or strenuous breath techniques. A couple of minutes of taking deep breaths can be a great way to get centered in preparation for meditation, a calming effect if you will, though for an extended period of time doing breath timed Simran or mantra meditation with the breath or focusing on the breath would be annoying from a Sant Mat perspective, always remaining tethered to the motor currents of the physical body. So Santmat being all about rising above body consciousness does not emphasize breath to any great extent. So that's a slight modification of that particular limb of yoga. The fifth limb of yoga, Pratyahara, withdrawal of the senses or drawing the attention inward to discover the source of the senses. The refocusing of your attention back to your goal in meditation practice whenever you notice your attention has strayed, and yes indeed, it will. The monkey mind will change the subject and try and lure you out of the meditative state. And you don't beat yourself up over that, you just notice it and refocus. Again, you come back again to your spiritual practice. That is Pratyahara. Six, Dharana, concentration or the practice of meditation, a quality increment or period of time that one spends focus during meditation, a successful period of time that you have achieved concentration in your attempt to meditate. Number seven, 
dhyana or clarity that arises from the quality of meditation. Not only an attempt at meditation, but successfully abiding in the depths of genuine meditation or true meditation, if you will. You could call it sat dhyana or true meditation where you're not fidgeting, you're not meditating some, but then, you know, getting distracted, but a quality time, a longer increment of time spent, focused. And the final limb of yoga, the eighth limb of yoga is samadhi. That is the highest stage, bliss, enlightenment, oneness, the ultimate reward of meditation, the state of being completely absorbed in meditation. So there's no longer, at this level, there's no longer you, there's just this state that now dominates samadhi. And it's also true that in India, the classic way the saints leave this world is to be sitting in the meditation posture and then later found dead by their disciples in that posture. And uh, tombs uh, where the ashes of saints are kept, uh, those are called samads or samadhis as well. So a kind of permanent spiritual rest, if you will. There's kind of a multiple use of the word samadhi in India. You know, it can be referring to the eighth limb of yoga, the ultimate meditation, success in meditation, a very deep abiding meditation where where it's no longer the I-thou relationship. There's only the thou. There's only the state of consciousness that you've reached. And uh, the big vacation or eternal meditation, if you will, the samads or tombs in India where the saints are, are remembered. Uh, they use that same word, which I find to be fascinating. Yama, the first stage, the ethical foundation, is also known as the five precepts, that first limb of yoga I talked about earlier. The ethical foundation of Santmat, the moral requirements for initiation, abstinence from alcohol and intoxicants, Two, ahimsa, or non-violence in thought, word, and deed, including in the area of diet, as in following a vegan diet or a vegetarian diet. Three, leading a truthful life for practicing non-stealing or an honest ethical source of one's income. Five, loyalty to one's spouse. That's another uh, version of yama, or the five precepts, the, foundation, the ethical foundation of the path of the masters, which makes it possible to qualify for diksha, or initiation, into Surat Shabd Yoga meditation, inner light and sound meditation, by a living master. As it says in the Gospel of Thomas, what your own eyes cannot see, your own ears do not hear, your physical hands cannot touch, and what is inconceivable to the human mind that I will give to you. That's a great definition of initiation. In the Sant tradition, the complete methods and secrets of meditation practice are communicated at the time of initiation by a living master or representative of a master. Not a past saint, not a holy book, not a channeled entity in orbit around the planet Jupiter or in the Pleiades or someplace else. A living teacher with a body here and now, during this present moment, during this life, a living teacher communicates the secrets of meditation practice to their students at the time of initiation. Stay tuned for more spiritual awakening coming up after this break. Welcome back to Spiritual Awakening Radio. A paraphrase or summary of the teachings of Maharishi Mehi Paramhans on the Sant Mat way of life. 
for those who are initiated into the mysteries of the kingdom of the heavens, who have their inner eye and inner ear opened up and begin exploring inner space, the kingdom of God within. Maharishi Mehi says, be faithful to the vegetarian diet. Keep doing your manas jap or simran, repeating the names of God, and maintain good behavior. Follow the ethical foundation of the path. Maharishi Mehi says, never discontinue satsang or meditation practice. Those who do not attend satsang and study the teachings of the saints will not pay attention will not be awake or aware. We practice both satsang, associating with the teachings of the masters and associating with other disciples or satsangis on the path, and we practice meditation. Maharishi Mehi says, be patient in the practice of sadhana or meditation. We always remember to do manas jap, also known as simran, the repetition of names of God and sadhana, or meditation practice. Following the thrice daily meditation format, meditating three times each day, including early in the morning, a time known as Brahma Muhurta, the Sikhs call it Amrit Vela, and actually monks and mystics from the various world religions also do that same thing, get up super early, whether it's Mount Athos or Buddhist monks, that early morning time where quietude is in the air is when many begin their day and their spiritual practice. Maharishi Mehi says, if the mind is focused, we will see visions within. And as we recite the hymns of the Sants or Padavali hymns each day, it's our loss if we do not feel the love found in these hymns of the Sants or Padavali. We have a daily time of satsang at home for the study or of scriptures or vani of the sants and to meditate including bhajan or meditating on the inner sound maharishi mehi says the spiritual exercises and practices of the saints are beneficial for us during this life it's best to follow them seven key practices of sant mat mysticism according to the teachings of maharishi mehi one satsang association with the saints. And this also includes the study of their writings or scriptures. Two, selfless service of a spiritual master or Siva, as it's known. Three, love for God or Bhakti. Bhakti is a very central holy word in the Sant tradition of India. Bhakti. Also greatly valued by the Krishnas or the Vaishnavas of India. Love for the Beloved, a theme you'll find universally in the world of Gnostics and Sufis, including Rumi poetry and the tradition of the Sants of India. Bhakti, love for God. Four, moral rectitude. Five, purity of the heart. Genuineness, in other words. Six, japa, the repetition of a divine name or names, Simran practice. And seven, dhyana, or meditation. In the practice of meditation, both gross and subtle meditations are described. And the subtle meditation is the meditation of the bindu point, the meditation of inner light. Drishti yoga, the yoga of vision. And meditation on the inner sound, also known as surat shabda yoga. The following are the five jewels of Sant Mat by Param Sant Tulsi Sahib of Hathras. There are five real jewels in this life, namely, association with sads, in other words, initiates or satsangis, devotees, the virtuous, sadhus, saints and sages. Two, saran or protection, taking the refuge of a living master, sitting at the feet of a living satguru. Three, love for humility, and five, compassion. Those are the five jewels of Sant Mat in this life.
Sarguna, or God with form, versus Narguna, the way of the formless God, in the Bhagavad Gita of Krishna. The kind of transition we are in from the world of form to formlessness. From a chapter of the Bhagavad Gita called The Way of Love. Arjuna, the disciple, said, Of those steadfast devotees who love you and those who seek you as the eternal, formless reality, who are the more established in yoga? Krishna, the guru with form, replies to his disciple, Those who set their hearts on me and worship me with unfailing devotion and faith are more established in yoga. As for those who seek the transcendental reality without name, a.k.a. nameless, without form, as in formless, contemplating the unmanifested beyond the reach of thought and of feeling with their senses subdued and mind serene and striving for the good of all beings, they too will verily come unto me. Yet hazardous and slow is the path to the unrevealed, difficult for physical creatures to tread. But they for whom I am the supreme goal, who do all the work renouncing self for me and meditate on me with single-hearted devotion, these I will swiftly rescue from the fragments cycle of birth and death, for their consciousness has entered into me, still your mind in me, still your intellect in me, and without doubt you will be united with me forever. Chapter 12, Bhagavad Gita. I've always fa been fascinated by this chapter because it describes both approaches, the Supreme Personality of Godhead being devoted to God with form, or in this case, a physical master, teacher, incarnation. But there's also described here another option, and that is uh, described as a, a bit more difficult for physical human beings such as us to do, to be devoted to the transcendental reality that's nameless and formless, without name, without form, contemplating the unmanifested. So here Krishna is saying it's easier for human beings to contemplate his form than to contemplate the form of the transcendent, nameless God. Of course, Sant Mat is all about following that path of the nameless, transcendent God, formless God. But you find both here in, in Krishna consciousness, and Maharishi Mehi Parmhans has talked about this too, and he sees this and other references in the Gita as presenting a transition. We contemplate the form of the Master and begin this process of transitioning from the world of form to formlessness. And so in the Sant tradition too, there is a stage where the spiritual practitioner contemplates the form of the master, but they also become in touch with the formless. They connect with the inner light, the inner sound, and begin this process of transitioning from form to formlessness. And so Maharishi Mehi, in his commentaries on the Bhagavad Gita, has not put it as a, a sort of either-or situation of either you are focused on a form like Krishna, for instance, and the supreme personality of Godhead, instead of being devoted to Anami, Parush, or Radha Swami, or the formless Lord of Love. It's not an either-or thing, but a transition from one to the other that happens during this process. As it says in the Gita, when the day of Brahma dawns, forms are brought forth from the unmanifest. When the night of Brahma comes, those forms merge in the formless 
again. How a formless God communicates with souls living in worlds of form. The radiant form is the key to exploring inner space. The inner Satguru God has made the reflection of his form available in all the worlds. The formless one assumes forms in order to communicate with souls in all realms and escorts them back to the original abode of the beloved. The outer master guides souls to the inner master. The inner master or Satguru guides souls back to God, the Lord of the soul. That unmanifested ultimate reality described in the Bhagavad Gita as Anami and Narguna, or nameless and formless, a god beyond the world of form. The following is from the discourses of Maharaj Sahib of the Radhaswami faith. The whole truth of it is that one's task will be accomplished when the fascinating form of the Satguru becomes manifest within one's heart. In the meantime, one will occasionally hear the inner sound or shabd and get bliss also, but the inner portal will one penetrate only when the fascinating form of the Satguru becomes manifest. The Satguru's form is the key, as it were, to opening the inner lock. Uh, or as he quotes here from the Sarbachan Radha Swami poetry of Swamiji Maharaj, if you do not become oblivious of the key provided by the Master, you will open the inner lock in a moment." Unquote. Radhaswami Dayal, the merciful Lord of the Soul, has graciously assumed human form to grant redemption to the entire humanity. Nay, he has made the reflection of his form available, even at the lower chakras. Unquote. From light to sound, from form to formlessness, stages of meditation on the path of the Masters. By practicing devotion through these four techniques, manas, japa, or simran, mantras, zikr, prayer of the name, it's called by others, the recitation of God's name, or names in meditation, manas, dhyana, focus on the divine form, drishti, sadhana, focus on the infinitesimal point and opening of the third eye center to see the inner light, and Nada sadhana or inner sound meditation, also called Surat Shab Yoga, the practitioner consecutively transcends the realms of darkness, light, and sound which cloak the supreme truth, the divine reality. There are various sequential stages of dhyana meditation. First, there is the meditation of physical form, either of the Sat Guru or any representation of the divine, says Swami Sant Seviji Maharaj. We think earlier of that passage from the Gita about people meditating on Krishna's form. That's a stage, contemplation of the form of the Master. Next, says Swami Sant Seviji, there is meditation on the formless, subtle form of inner light. The focus on the infinitesimal small point is followed by the meditation on sound. Finally, there is meditation beyond any sound or form, the subtlest unqualified form of the divine. These are the increasingly more and more subtle stages of meditation. In this way, we undertake sequential steps to accomplish complete focus leading to the ultimate realization or samadhi. That's a passage from Swami Sant Seviji Maharaj. The meditation on the sound is formless and transcends the realm of names and forms. Through this meditation the practitioner reaches the Supreme Being. That's a sentence from Swami Vyasanan from his book The Inward Journey of the Soul. He also says about formlessness, the formless pervades the forms. Here he is capitalizing formless as a name of God or description of the Supreme Being. 
The formless pervades forms. The realm of light is the manifestation of the form of the macrocosmos, or Brahmananda. And the sound is the formless macrocosm. The practitioner who becomes accomplished in the light realms begins to experience divine sound along with various divine light experiences. However, after the center of Trikuti, the light form becomes absorbed in the sound that is formless, since the form arises out of formlessness. According to the natural law, anything that is created must return to its source and be dissolved therein. The meditation on the sound is formless and transcends the realm of name and form. Through this meditation, the practitioner reaches the Supreme Being. Through this practitioner, the meditator goes beyond all obstacles and achieves the ultimate freedom from the cycle of birth and death. The practitioner becomes free from taking birth in this world. The practitioner whose consciousness grasps the central sound, even once, escapes the afflictions of time, or call, and death, unquote, says Swami Vyasanand in The Inward Journey of the Soul. The way that paragraph ends, it reminds me of a passage from the Brahm Nairupan of the Kabir tradition that, you know, contemplating that high sarshabd from Sachkhand, even for 15 seconds, is, is of greater value than, you know, doing religious rituals for a thousand years in some holy city of India. I forget the name of the city, but he's basically saying 15 minutes of that sound will get more done, will transform you, will alter your destiny more than all the rites and rituals in the world for lifetime, countless lifetimes. Lifetimes and more lifetimes. Stay tuned for more Spiritual Awakening Radio coming up after this break. Mat teachings present in the Hindu scriptures today on Spiritual Awakening Radio. I want to read very carefully and slowly and clearly this passage from the Bhagavad Gita. The disciple Arjuna asks his spiritual master Krishna a fascinating question. Of those steadfast devotees who love you, and those who seek you as the eternal formless reality, who are the more established in yoga? Krishna, the master with form, replies to his disciple, those who set their hearts on me and worship me with unfailing devotion and faith are more established in yoga. Then he goes on to say, as for those who seek the transcendental reality without name, anami or nameless in other words, without form, formless, or narguna in other words, contemplating the unmanifested beyond the reach of thought and of feeling, with their senses subdued and mind serene, and striving for the good of all beings, they too will verily or truly come unto me. Yet hazardous and slow is the path to the unrevealed, difficult for physical creatures to tread." Unquote. Krishna is saying that this other path, this other way to get to the Supreme Being, about rising above body consciousness and contemplating the transcendental, formless, nameless God, is not as easy for human beings such as we to do here in this physical plane, but he's not ruling it out. He's not saying this instead of that. He's presenting in this uh, passage both paths to the divine, if you will. So there is no hostility here to Narguna Bhakti in the name of 
following the Sarguna path of form, devoted to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, rather both are presented as options. Maharishi Mehdi Paramhans, in his commentary on the Gita, which is in English and is available for free online, comments on the Bhagavad Gita and presents the teachings of Krishna in light of Sant Mat uh, and points out that Sant Mat incorporates both elements of Sarguna and Narguna together, presenting a transition from one to the other, that the formless God uses incarnations, sons of Sat Purush, to come here and communicate with souls and reveals to them a spiritual path that allows them to transition from the world of the outside to the world of within, from the world of form to the formlessness, to make that transition back to the Supreme Being once again. The following is from Swami Sant Seviji's book, Harmony of All Religions. There are various sequential stages of meditation. First, there is the meditation of the physical form, either of the Sat Guru or an, an e or a representation of the divine. Next, there is meditation on the formless subtle form of inner light, the focus on the meditation on sound comes after that. And finally, there is meditation beyond any sound or form, the most subtle, unqualified form of the divine. There are the increasingly more and more subtle stages of meditation. In this way, we undertake sequential steps to accomplish complete focus, leading to the ultimate realization." Unquote. We transition from form to formlessness from the physical plane through the inner regions and back to God again. This is a fascinating passage from the Gita. He who remembers the poet, the creator, who rules all things from all time, smaller than the smallest atom, but upholding this vast universe, who shines like the sun beyond darkness, far, far beyond human thought, and at the time of his death or departure, is in union of love and the power of yoga, and with a mind that wanders not, keeps the power of his life between his eyebrows, or the third eye center. He goes to that Spirit Supreme, the Supreme Spirit of Light. Fascinating. Leaving this world, exiting the body, by way of the third eye center. Some commentary by Swami Vyasanand, the seat of the soul, the third eye center. The soul is pure, therefore, by nature, still. Due to stillness, the soul is eternal. Lord Krishna advises that the mind should be connected to the soul. Self-realization is the objective and the goal of all human life. But where can we obtain this goal? The answer is within one's heart. By heart is not meant the physical heart, but rather the heart of the inner self. This is called by the saints the yoga heart or innermost self. It is in this space in which the mind is linked to the soul. The saints have described this place with many such names as the sky portal, the tenth gate, the point, the window, the lotus flower, sukmana, the Ajna Chakra, the third eye, the center of the eyebrows, Bindu, etc. Swami Vyasanand in his book, The Inward Journey of the Soul, a Kindle ebook, an Amazon Kindle ebook, translated into English a couple of years back. We exit the world at the time of death by way of the third eye center. That is just fascinating, a fascinating passage from the Gita that after I read it, I just bookmarked that page. I thought that was absolutely amazing. We are in a transition in the path of the saints and mystics, the path of the masters. We are transitioning from the outer world to the inner world, from the physical plane to the inner regions. We are transitioning from identifying with the body to re-identifying with our true self or soul 
and making this transition from the world of forms to formlessness once again. And formless or formlessness is a high holy name for the Supreme Being called Anami or Nameless, Lord of the Soul or Radhaswami, Sat Purush as in Supreme Original True Being. We're on our way back to God again. And the meditation practice is all about making this transition from form to formlessness. My name is James Bean. Thanks for joining me today on Spiritual Awakening Radio. My email address is james at spiritualawakeningradio.com. My text number is 508-603-9381. Be sure to visit my website, spiritualawakeningradio.com. And tune in again next week at this same time for another edition of Spiritual Awakening Radio. Mm-hmm.